Hey guys, it's me again. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about something we all do. Some of us, like me, love it, but the truth is most of us don't get enough sleep. Yes, I'm talking about sleep. According to the National Sleep Foundation, sleep is essential for a person's health and well being. Yet many people suffer from lack of it, and it can be for many different reasons. So, what we've done is put together a great talk divided into four parts. Which will hopefully give you everything you need to know about sleep. So, what's up for today? We're going to address two basic questions. Why is sleep so important? And what's the significance of the circadian rhythm? Oh, there you are. I'm just trying to get to sleep now because it's been a long day and a lot of things to catch up on and whatnot. But how do you unwind? How do you get to sleep? All these questions will be answered today on my channel. With Dr. Sanjeev Patel, who is a board certified sleep specialist and pulmonologist and critical care specialist. So join me today and figure out how you can best get to sleep and stay asleep and wake up refreshed. Welcome back, everyone. I have the pleasure tonight of having. One of my good friends from Denver, who practiced with me um, as a, a pulmonologist and sleep physician while I was a cardiac surgeon uh, in Denver, and he is going to talk to us today a little bit about sleep because that's what he he does, and that's something which we all need more of. He was uh, trained at the University of Akron in a six-year um, combined undergrad med program. From there, he went to the University of Kentucky. For, I'm sorry, he did his, his training in Ohio, and then he went to the University of Kentucky for his uh, residency and fellowship in pulmonology and in uh, critical care and sleep. And then he was in Denver for a while when I was there, and then he now practices in Ohio. So welcome to the channel, Sanjeev. It's a real pleasure to have you on board today. Let, let's start from the mundane to the complicated. The mundane would be, look, you and I were raised as residents and, and fellows thinking, you know, eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't mess with the pancreas, and basically sleep when you're dead, right? And what we've learned is sleep is an essential part of living. Tell me a little bit about that. Why, why do we need to sleep? Absolutely. You know, so, yeah, this, is, this will be, to answer your question, this will be my 22nd year of doing sleep medicine now. That's so great. I've been doing this for a while and it's passion. I, I love sleep and it's such a unique thing. So you know, it's a great question, Ron. You know, we've been posing this question forever. Why do we need to sleep? And it's not fully understood, but we know sleep is so essential. If you look at even single cell organisms, bacteria even have some form of sleep. Okay, so every organism on this planet has some form of sleep or another. So we know it's crucial to every living being. Plants have a cycle where they reduce. Bacteria have cycles where they don't move as much, um, all the way up to complex animals like us and mammals, you know. And so we know sleep is integral to functioning of the brain, to the immune system, to help with our metabolism. So we know it's the restorative process for the body. And if you deny sleep to an animal or plant, it dies. Um, you know, and unfortunately, there were studies that were done in the 60s where they had animals where they wouldn't let them sleep. And at some point they would actually start to then lose their hair. They would start to lose fingernails and skins and eventually they died. Wow. You know, so sleep is an integral function to our brain and what we do. And, you know, and, and it's interesting. It's something we really don't think much about, right? You spend a third of your life sleeping. That's right. And we just don't think that much about it. And it's something funny that I give in a lot of lectures. I'll ask people, okay, so, you know, how long did you research the last car you bought? Right. You know, you're a car guy like I am. And we talk about cars and, you know, we want, you know, this, this color, we want these options. And I, I probably researched a car about a good couple of weeks or a month before I go buy it, sure. you know, and, and we spend 5% of our day at most in a car. Right. Now, if I ask you, how long did you research the last pillow and mattress you bought, which you spend a third of your day doing, Yep. You probably didn't spend that much time, right? So it's it's interesting how we look at things and sleep is so integral. Um, and that's what I like about some of the newer technologies that are coming out. It's getting people to think about their sleep. In a second with the technologies. Yeah. Turn back a little bit. So so I'll I'll give them the basics on 
the structures in the brain and all of that yeah. in the trauma map. But what's fascinating to me is something you said that, you know, if, if you don't have sleep, you, you will not, you will succumb. And some of the basic processes that I think of, and maybe you can enhance that is the restorative processes, the growth processes, and then finally memory consolidation happens. Mm -hmm. And so memory is something we should talk about because people have been commenting on this for a long time, but they think both in REM and non-REM, which we'll talk about and define, um, that all of the stuff you did in the day, all of the memories you've been picking up um, will be consolidated at nighttime. And we don't know if that happens during dreaming and that's how dreaming works, or whether it happens during the deep sleep phase or the light sleep phase, who knows? But tell me what your thoughts are. Is it really a regenerative cocoon, kind of like Darth Vader's little uh, box that they put him in at nighttime or, or, or a back to tank? Or is it just something that your body needs a break on to recharge its batteries? Well, I need to, and I think that's a great analogy, Ron. And that's how, that's an analogy I use a lot of my patients. You know, you think of your brain like a cell phone. You charge it at nighttime when you're sleeping. And so sleeping is recharging the battery. And then as you use the phone during the daytime, the cells are creating oxidative stress. They're using up glucose and different things and creating all these chemicals and byproducts, just like when we eat and we drink. And then at some point, you've got to remove those byproducts. And the thought is the sleep is where those byproducts get cleared and removed. And when we look at some data, you know, there was some data done by the World Health Organization when they looked at nurses who did shift work, who chronically did shift work, they actually had a higher incidence of having breast cancer. Okay, so and developing that, certain types of cancers. So there's a thought of all these, what we call super oxidases and radicals that can destroy cells and different things. But when we sleep at nighttime, we create these enzymes and things to break down those radicals. Very well, when you disrupt that sleep, you know, and people chronically do sleep work, those things don't happen. And so there's more damage to the cells. So actually the World Health Organization has listed chronic shift work as a carcinogen that it could cause cancer. Oh. Wow. You know, so, so we definitely know, you know, um, I, I open up a slide for a lot of my lectures and I open up pictures of um, Exxon Valdez, Bhopal, India, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and the Challenger disaster. Okay, so we think about the major industrial disasters we've seen in our lifetimes or even before. All of them either directly or indirectly had some sleep issue directly linked with them. So either people fell asleep during a monitoring process, they were sleep deprived, so they made mental miscalculations on numbers and math. Yep. And so if you think about it, you know, we talk about in the US alone, that sleep disorders can cost us almost 100 to $150 billion a year. And, you know? and not just cost wise, but you know, I'd seen a figure as high as 58,000 people between 2005, 2016. And then in one year alone, they had 800 deaths in addition, so 58,000 people died in traffic related accidents due to sleep um, deprivation. And so, you know, you, it, what the point you're making is very interesting. The first is that it's not just about your brain, it's about the rest of your body in a regenerative cocoon, literally. Let's talk a little bit about the sleep process. So I know there's a lot of people that think you can just hop into bed and that's it. But there's something called a circadian rhythm. Tell me a little bit about that. So, you know, we all have this biological clock, right? So that tells us kind of when to sleep and when we wake. And the clock is very interesting because that clock doesn't just control your sleep. It controls blood pressure, sugar levels. You know, so often patients who have allergies, they'll find that they have more congestion around the mid-afternoon period because we have a natural dip in our cortisol level. And that helps with that anti-inflammatory process. Um, you know, we see more heart attacks and strokes earlier in the morning as our body started to ramp up to wake up. You know, and the circadian rhythm is very interesting because, you know, we, we all talk about getting sleepy after eating. We call it post prandial You know, you eat a big lunch, you get sleepy. Well, it really doesn't have anything to do with eating. And it has more to do with the time of the day, right? You know, you've looked at all these videos. Um, we've all grown up with these videos of the... Uh, the lions and stuff on the African plains. And what do they do in the afternoon? You know, they sleep. Yes. We talk about the afternoon siesta in Latin American countries. You know, often in India we sleep in the afternoon. It's because it's the hottest time of the day. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it takes more energy to hunt and work and play when it's hot. 
So our bodies have learned to evolve over time where we slow down during the hottest part of the day to conserve our energy. Very. And then as the day cools down, we ramp up. So that's why you see most of these animals hunt around the five, six, seven o'clock bang when it's kind of early evening and it's cooling down. So that's that natural clock that tells us when to sleep and wake. And hundreds of years ago, we would follow the natural rhythm, which is developed by the sun. So light tells us when to sleep and wake and affects that body clock. Well, now that we're in the, the modern era, we have all these artificial suns all around us that keep us awake and have totally messed up that whole circadian rhythm. So it's a challenge, you know, how in the modern world we do things differently. At what point, you know, they talk about adults needing seven to nine year, uh, nine hours and it should be all in one go. Whereas as you get older, 65 or older, it becomes the same amount of time, but they'll nap during the day and sleep less at night. Is that right? Drinking alcohol, which people do at nighttime with dinner or whatever. How many hours before you sleep should you wait before you sleep? And should you be drinking if you're really, really tired? Does it make sense? What about what you sleep on? If you like what you're hearing, hit the like button. Want to share it with all your friends? That would be great and hit the subscribe button if you want to see more episodes from this channel. Hit the bell icon so that you can be alerted to the next one that we come up with. Thank you for joining us as always. It's always been a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you again.